Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming into the space. Thank you, we believe, uh, once again, navigating some double registration and uh, thank you for your persistence. But come on into the space and we will give ourselves a couple minutes to allow our international family to join us, to get here, to grab their snacks, their PB and J, their afternoon drink, depending on where you are. If you're in SA, you're probably already on to your wine. Get it. Uh, but we will get started in a couple of moments. Now, if we were as cool as the GSBA, we would have music playing already because they always have great entrance room music. But the thing is, that if I just connected my Spotify right now, it would be right in the middle of a Celine Dion song. Uh, Actually, so maybe what that I hear work. you saying, Laura, is it's an invitation for me to sing. That's that's basically. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, wait, it's Celine Dion. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So I got a one of these, mm -hmm. and then there's like, uh, oh, wait, okay, what's the Titanic one? My heart will go on. There. Yeah, yeah. It's the wood flute. Ah, where? Oh, can I hit it? <clears throat> Mimi, where at? Nope. Mm -mm. I tried for all of you. It was just where? Okay, drop it down and up. Wherever you are. Let's go alto. You know, that that is a Thank whole you. octave jump in that moment right there. I mean, know yourself. Just nailed it. You love an accountability moment. No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, don't pretend you're a soprano. Don't, you know. Okay. Oh, you're nailing it. We'll just put it in whatever key you want. We'll do a little accompaniment <laughs> next time. Exactly. Yeah. And then what's the one where where they're coming back and it's is it like meatloaf and Celine or what was the other power ballad um it's 1990s I'm watching VH1 oh you're taking me back <sighs> somebody said they have a song cued I don't know if it's I don't know how I don't know who they are Jean says who who Jean where Jean what? says they have a song cued <laughs> how do you share can they share Jean can you share I think it'll just have to be more singing. I mean, it just feels like a technical requirement for us to uh, this do this. Is a setup. Are you, I, all this is going to lead to is people saying, Lynn, stick with your day job. Um, this is your day job. Uh, is this? <laughs> I out some like, this little light of mine. We had to go gospel. There it is. I'm going to let it shine. Oh. This little line of mine, I'm gonna let. Okay, for those who this is their first time joining, is it always like this? Yes, yes, yeah. it is. So um, you are in the right space. But we're also here to discuss unlearning the binary. Laura, shall I take it away? Are we Please. welcome, everybody? We are so excited that you are here today. We are joined, we are co-hosting, we are passing the mic and the floor today to the GSBA. And um, as always, as we get started, we wanna remind you of our housekeeping, our take your shoes off and kick back rules. Remember that if you would like to activate live captions, please go to the little CC at the bottom of your screen if that would improve your experience of being in community together. We hope that you read our community guidelines before joining, but in summation, they are treat people in this space the way that I would expect you to treat them. See that variation there? So uh, it's the way that I would expect you to treat them. And we will be recording because our community is so diverse. They're crossing time zones. They're balancing small humans and four-legged friends. And there is always a desperate plea that we provide a recording afterwards. We, the panelists, will be on that recording. You will only be on that recording if you come off of mute and ask a question, which is not a uh, prompt to never come off of mute and ask a question. I promise that you look just fine uh, if you do it. We uh, want to invite you all 
after the uh, show, the panel, the time and space together to check out this new Whizbang thing that we've been developing, which is a software platform we're going to be rolling out for uh, DEI leaders, HR leaders, organizational leaders for small to mid-sized businesses. And there's going to be a link at the end where you can register to get on our waiting list. <laughs> be the first and best dressed. And now I would like to pass it to Ilona, who is joining us from the GSBA to tell us a little bit about the GSBA, ELO. See, I fought the urge in that first pass to just go to my term of endearment, but uh, it is my great pleasure to have you here. Tell us about the GSBA and about this exciting event that's coming up. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. We've done so many joint events in the past, and I'm just honored to that you're inviting the GSBA crew to your event. Um, for those of you who don't know GSBA, we are Washington State's LGBTQ plus and allied chamber of commerce. Uh, we also have a scholarship fund, been around since the 80s, scholarship fund since the 90s, and we strive for um, economic and educational equity um, across Washington state. Now, the slide you see is actually for our upcoming uh, GSBA Pride pop-up and luncheon. So what can you expect? The first hour and a half from 1030 to noon, there will be a pop-up shop uh, of LGBTQ plus owned small businesses who are going to uh, showcase their services and sell their products. And then at noon, we have an amazing uh, panel discussion or fireside chat uh, with Denise Diskin, who's the ED of uh, QLA Foundation, and also Dominic Stevens, who's the ED of the Ingersoll Gender Center. And they're going to be talking about um, current state of uh, uh, the current state of the country with LGBTQ plus rights under attack across the country, Roe v. Wade um, and its effects uh, on our state here in Washington and also um, sharing some action items that people can take away and translate uh, aside from voting, you know, what can people do? Yeah, so anybody who's interested in this event, uh, we also have sliding scale tickets, uh, can contact us at uh, either on our website and register at thegsba.org or contact our office, which is office at thegsba.org. And with that, I'll send it right back to you, Lindsay. Thank you. And I cannot stress enough uh, how important this partnership uh, with GSBA with all of our community is to every member of our community, but specifically to uh, the team here at LTHJ Global. Two years ago, uh, two years ago, gosh, maybe three, I found myself recently divorced uh, and uh, stumbling into COVID being furloughed and then uh, you know, released from my role and uh, had a fledgling idea of a business that I had been working on part-time and was ready to move to full-time. And Elo and Terea reached out and said, hey, you like to talk a lot. <laughs> Would you like to help us come up with a show idea? And I said, you're gonna pay me to talk a lot? Yes, please. And uh, we launched what became known as Keeping It Real with Lindsay T.H. Jackson as we started to navigate COVID and all of that, all of that, I would be uh, remiss if I did not say, has helped to create the success of what, LG, uh, what LTHJ Global has done over the three years. So if you are a small or mid-sized business or a student needing mentoring, needing support, needing guidance, or just straight up love, GSBA. That's, that's my shameless plug and I will do it uh, until my last gasping breath. So what's up with today? We are going to start by just taking a moment to honor and name that uh, we as a community have been experiencing trauma after trauma and to remind ourselves that it is 
uh, not only important, it is imperative to grieve. And that grieve has five stages for a reason. And as Ilona said, when you are ready to get to anger and what you can do that is useful as a change agent with anger, be sure to tap into our community's leaders who have already been doing this work consistently, every day doing the work, doing the practice so that we can finally get to acceptance with the change that we have instilled. And so we are here to support you in these feelings. Organizations like GSBA are here to support you with these feelings, but uh, we have to name them. We have to name that we're all feeling it and not pretend that that low grade anxiety that we're feeling every minute as we navigate this stuff is not impacting us. So thank you for coming together today so that we can once again be in community and create space across difference, not in spite of. Already ticked off one bullet point. Look at me being an organizational leader. Uh, next, we're gonna get into a guided panel discussion and I'm so excited to introduce this panel. Some of them I have been gently stalking on Instagram. I know you all are always wondering like, what does Lindsay actually do? I basically just gently stalk people on Instagram all the time. And uh, then we're gonna make time for your questions and we will as always make time for uh, final reflection. So if you have to drop off at the end of the hour because of uh, competing priorities, we understand that, but reminder that in this space, we do take that extra 15 minutes to really just hold time for community and reflection, but uh, invitation to do what you need to. Let's take a breath together. The topic today is unlearning the binary and just take a moment to go in and reflect on what's coming up for you when I say that, unlearning the binary. What's going on in your heart space and the solar plexus? What's going on in the armpits and the abdomen? in the head, the shoulders. As we enter into these topics, as we invite our panelists up, constantly returning to the I work, the I work. First up, uh, so what uh, Laura Kay, maybe like six months ago, I said, I've been following this person on Instagram. Their name's Dr. Lulu. Please come up with the reason to tempt them to come speak with us. And in all of their brilliance and excellence, Laura Kay managed to get Dr. Lulu here, aka the mama nutrition, is a Nigerian born pediatrician and mom of a non binary transgender young adult. And Dr. Lulu, I'm so excited to talk to you about this because through a deep loving relationship, I am now becoming, as they call me, vague stepmother to a non-binary teenager. And so uh, what is what is a mama trition and, and why, why is that work of uh, health for young people? Why does thinking about our teenager and the ways that they identify, the ways that they explore their sense of self, why is that important to the practice of healthcare? So a mom attrition is a mom and a pediatrician. It's a word that I made up a few years ago and I went ahead and trademarked it. So I also own the trademark in North America of the mom attrition, a mom and a pediatrician because I just, at one point, I just realized I cannot separate the two. She is I and I am her. Mm. So I'm a mom and a pediatrician. And as of December of last year, it went from non-binary to full-blown transgender. So we're no longer non-binary. So my apologies when I saw that, I was like, God, it's too late to change that. But my eldest child, my eldest human, identifies as she, her at this point. But at that point, it was still in evolution. Mm. Like in medicine, when you have a stroke in evolution, is a stroke that is not done yet. 
mm. and um, you could still have more damage to organs. So stopping it right away <laughs> is of utmost importance. But in this case, it was an ongoing thing. And I actually watched it evolve from assigned male at birth to gay at 12 to 16, to non-binary at 20, and then at 24, we're transgender. So I've been here for all of it. It's been, I think, the most difficult thing I've ever done. I had three children with no epidural, and I thought that was hard. I've had two divorces, and I thought those were hard. I've been a commander in the US Air Force. I had to do the ropes and send my boys downrange, my girls, my people to war. And I thought that was difficult. I've never lost a parent, I've never lost a sibling, but I tell you, losing the child that I had in my head, the child mm. that I planned for, the child that I wanted in the sense that I didn't know enough and most parents don't know enough and it's okay for you to have dreams, children. It's okay for you to plan for your kids. What I've learned though is to include your child in your dreams. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here to talk about inclusion, right? Every parent must remember to include their child in their dreams. And um, yeah, whether it's a non-binary child, a regular straight cisgendered kid, whichever kind of kid it is, most parents plan. We have all these plans and dreams. My dad said, you want to be an architect? No, you should do something girly like pharmacy. I'm like, what? Why? And I was like, well, you know, your cousin is a pharmacist. I said, that's it? <laughs> well, if I'm going to go to med school, why don't I just become a doctor? Like, why stop at pharmacy in my mind? Again, you don't know. You don't know. And when my first kid came along, I was like, I think this kid is gay at two. Then I told my mom and she was like, bring the holy water. Oh, my goodness. We're Catholic. Can you tell? Don't ever say that again. Splashing holy water everywhere. And I was like, okay, what are you trying to do? Banish the devil from your kid? Mm. As, as the child grew, they were filled with wisdom, just like the good book says, and fear of faith. And just and my nonstop sentence that I said all through childhood was, stop acting like a girl. Stop acting like a girl. Fun stuff. And so needless to say, my memoir is called Stop Acting Like a Girl. Mm. As a parent, we tend to say, don't do this and don't do that and stop doing this. What if what I was doing this whole time was saying, stop being yourself, which is what I was saying. Stop, don't be who you are. And so several weeks ago, I sent a text message saying, you know what? I'm so proud of you. I'm just so proud of you living your authenticity, just living your real self in spite of everything, because you are my child. You do come from greatness, but this is another realm. And I got a text and I said, I've always wanted a daughter to go shopping with, you know? And the text I got back was, mom, you've always had a daughter. Mm. And so I want people to just hear me when I say, I want you to remember as a parent, you're not the most important person in your child's life. Your child is always going to be the most important person in their life, but you are the most influential person in your child's life. I had to learn that the hard way. And I was accused of not affirming her when she first told me she was trans. And that is true. It was not an accusation because it was real. Because I ran, I took off and I ran. I was like, oh my goodness. And if I, who is a queer person, would run, and I, when I ran all the way to the mall, I stopped there, I cried and cried and cried. And I looked back and there was fear and shame and guilt and insecurity and disbelief and, and all of the stuff that I was trying to run away from. So, phew, let's just say I have to stop and feel all the feels like you said. And then I said to myself, self, you know all those days you used to ask God, God, why me? Why give me a gay son? Why, why me? And God was like, hmm, if you only knew what I have in stock for you, if you only knew what I plan for you. And so today I quit being a pediatrician, but I can never be, quit being a mom. And in a sense, I'm practicing the real sense of, what do they call it, preventative medicine. Because now I'm like, okay, let's stop these kids from jumping. But how do I do that? Let me get to the most influential person in their life, their parents. If I can 
you to accept that you are, because the biggest problem is not the parent rejecting the child. What the parent is doing is rejecting themselves as a parent of a queer child. That's what it is. That's what I discovered. I was not accepting myself as a mother of a queer child. That's what we do. Where all of those emotions were because of, I don't want to, what would my friends say? What would my church say? What would, what would whoever say? And so I don't want to take too much more. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, you can find them at Dr. Lulu. And you may all join me now in uh, following them on Instagram. You see why. I, Dr. Lulu. <laughs> I mean, first of all, everybody go ahead and write down the note, right? You need to include your child in planning your child's life. Put it on your arm, put it on wherever you need to see it every day to remind yourself to unlearn the practice of adultism, the assumption that you know more about the child than the child knows about themselves. To this, you know, invitation, Dr. Lulu, to... uh, uh, the 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 statement, uh, I'm wondering everybody here if it impacted you as it impacted me. I was not rejecting my child. I was rejecting my vision of myself as the parent of a trans child, a lesbian child, a gay child, an intersex child. And that lack of growth that we as the adult are unwilling to engage in. I hope you all understand the conversation that we're setting up for today, because as always, this is not a space where where Laura has brought us together to show us everybody who is just aspirational. I have everything figured out. Dr. Lulu, what I love about your work is that you're showing us the journey of growth and development. And so if anybody is on the call right now and they're Uh, finding themselves still early in their journey of unlearning the binary. This, the books that Dr. Lulu has contributed to all of us and to the world, an opportunity to engage in the growth. And this work is about growth. Next up, we have uh, River, who is joining us from the GSBA. And she is a spirited advocate for the LGBTQ uh, IA plus community who brings her warmth and encouraging nature to business education and growth. And let's be honest, River, to everything that you touch. River, I saw some serious head nods there as Dr. Lulu was speaking. What has your own journey been around unlearning the binary? Yeah, you know, that's that's really a, a, a good prompt. And thank you for the lead in. You know, I grew up in rural Texas, and I have been fortunate enough to, to maintain a relationship with my mother, but it wasn't through, uh, it, it was definitely through a lot of work on both of our ends. And there were a lot of dialogues about like, her grief and my grief and this like perceived loss of a son. And I always want to speak to that, right? Because um, fundamentally, I was able to be more authentically myself post-transition than I really ever was pre-transition. And all of the things that she loved about me that, that made me her favorite person in the whole world, those still got to be fundamentally true about me. And um It's interesting because when we think about the nuances of unlearning the binary, right, I identify socially as a a binary trans woman, but when I'm engaging with my community and like crafting the dialectic and and, like, like teaching like, like people that are within my innermost social circles, like it's, it's definitely a little bit more nuanced than that, right? Like I don't fit the perfect, like, binary representation of a trans woman and I am still a trans person and I identify as non-binary a little bit too and that is something that's incredibly fulfilling and um you know when we jumped in for our quick little tech check we talked briefly about how like the last two years uh the nature of time and how we move through it is really strange and hard to like wrap our heads around and the eight months that I have been at the GSBA have flown by 
not just because of the pandemic, not just because of the, na- the nebulous nature of the way time is working now, but because I have found myself in this position where I get to be authentically embodied in a way that I have never had the experience mm. to do. And now I get to do all of these really beautiful LGBTQ plus inclusion trainings for all of these orgs. And I get to, you know, you, you mentioned as we started, right? If this dialogue shifts even one person's narrative or makes one person's day a little bit better or somebody walks away from this and they're like oh i get it or i can interact with the world through a trauma-informed and empathetically informed lens then we've like done our job here right and any like incremental pushing of the envelope is really powerful because bureaucracy mental health dialogue it all moves at this like glacially slow pace and it takes a lot of patience especially when you're immersed in these communities that are consistently dealing with so much shared collective trauma and like I love when I end up at like a panel and I'm looking through all of these speaker bios and everything and I go wow, I am really privileged to be here. I'm really like excited to be among these educators and these people who have devoted their life to what I am just like in the infancy of devoting my life to. And it's, um, yeah, it's really beautiful. Thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm very excited to be here among some really, really lovely folks. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's just uh, call it out because I know somebody is on this call and they're going, can somebody please tell me what is the binary? So coming from the GSBA who is constantly doing this uh, work of education and advocacy, how, how, where do you start? What is the binary? What is that concept? Sure, yeah. So uh, think of it in, in, from a, a kind of dialectical perspective, right? So we have the like male and female orientation that we have all been buffeted with as we are growing up, right? This kind of like very like, let's put everyone in a box idea of gender. When we talk about sexuality, I'm sure many of the people in the room here have heard it described as a spectrum, right? When we talk about the Kinsey scale, gender is much the same. If you think of it as a nice little sliding thing that you can move through and, um, when we look at the greater umbrella of trans people and trans issues and trans identities, I think it's really interesting, right? Because some folks identify as non-binary and transgender. Some folks identify as non-binary and they don't identify as transgender. And really like whatever label you can craft for yourself that makes you feel empowered and makes you feel like you can move through the world in an authentic way. Um, But Unlearning the binary was such a, a beautiful prompt when I talked to Laura about this, you know, we, we had a really, a really good conversation. I remember we were both very disappointed that we had a meeting on the back end because we were like, well, I got to I got to go because I've got another meeting. But this is great. Um, as much as we can decouple ourselves from prescriptivism, right? When mm. we look at language, it's always changing and um, worldviews are, are, are much the same. Like societal perceptions of gender and the way that we move through them and embody them always shifting right and as much as we can say hey like things have changed a little bit and that's okay I think that's a really powerful thing but to speak to your initial question now that I've rambled just a bit um, the binary is is very much what we are raised with it's that nice little box you're put into when you're born and and some people go hey I don't like that box and I don't hate that box implicitly maybe i just want to slide slightly out of it and some people distance themselves from it completely and that's when we dialogue about like a binary trans person and a non-binary trans person yes yes thank you for that thank you for that i want to bring up to the floor uh tokozani joining us thank you i believe it is very late and so we are all very uh humbled that you would join us at such an hour but i love this language the nosy researcher (laughs) by day and an ancestor summoning poet writer by night queering and radically imagining realities within human rights and transitional justice what Tokazani is a world that is outside 
of this limited binary. Again, remember when we're talking about the attributes of white supremacy culture as defined by Tima Okun and Kenneth Jones, we think of this either or thinking. And so binary thinking yeah. is a part of our dominant cultural norm. And so can you even in your, you know, poetic verse that, you know, again, 35 minutes of a deep dive when I went to just look up something on your website. Can you paint a picture for us of what can we even imagine of living outside of that binary? Oof. <laughs> Thank We're you into so the much, tough questions. <laughs> Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm so excited. And I think this is a really beautiful uh, prompt um, because this is something Laura and I had kind of spoken about when we're thinking about, you know, the, um, the structure of the world, right? Um, and when we look at the structure of the world and, and, and there's always intersections and links. Um, we can't separate gender from race. We can't separate... Uh, race from womanhood. We can't separate. There's so many links um, within existence and existing and identity. Um, and I think that sometimes we forget that gender also is somewhat of an ism. It is a structure. It is a, it is a construct. It is something that was created. And specifically, if we look at like colonial history, gender was created just as race was created to other and to uh, create dichotomies. You know, if we look at black womanhood, right? Um, and, and how black womanhood came about, it was literally created in direct opposition to white femininity and, you know, the innocence of whiteness and white women. Uh, whereas black women were considered savage and hypersexual and, 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 right? So, for me, I always feel like when we talk about gender, it's very easy for us to think that gender interrogation is um, a trans-specific or gender diverse or marginalized um, genders process mm. that only trans folks or um, gender diverse individuals are the ones who need to interrogate gender because we are transitioning, we are moving through this you know, spectrum. Um, but I think gender interrogation is something that needs, and, and this is you know, leaning towards how we reimagine existing beyond the binary, right? And I think even within binaries, within being cisgender, um, you can still exist beyond the binary. And that comes with unlearning the binary. Um, and in order to do that, it's really about trying to figure out what gender means to you and the ways in which you benefit, the ways in which you're disadvantaged, the ways in which it affects the way you interact with others, the way others interact with you, the way that you're perceived, the way you perceive others, um, and learning how to navigate, because I think, unfortunately, and this is not to say that gender as a construct is bad, but I think that the foundations of gender are a little weak. And so teasing out what it means to exist as yourself as a woman, what it means to exist as yourself as a man, you know, like when people say, be a man, how does that disadvantage you? What is that? What does that say about your experiences and what does that take away from your experience in life uh, mm -hmm. when people are talking about you know womanhood is x uh womanhood is having a womb what does that mean like you know it's it's how are you excluding people from this experience or this moment by being so essentialist about what it means to exist and i think that's why it's really important when we are radically reimagining existing in this world, engaging with each other, living with each other, talking each other into existence, that we all take on that role to in interrogate what it is, how we are being reflected in the world. The same way that unlearning racism is a thing that we're all trying to do. Um, and it's not just, you know, we've now debunked the myth that it is a black community thing and it's black folks have to be the ones to lead the child. Like we have debunked that, that, you know, 
unlearning racism is it's a community thing. It's everybody. It's, you know, people of color, it's black people, it's white people. Everybody needs to unlearn racism to a certain degree. Right. And it's the same with gender. We need to unlearn a lot of these harmful stereotypes and markers and um, misconceptions and conceptions and ideas around gender as a collective to be able to navigate the world together in a safe um, and compassionate way, I think. And I think that's how I radically reimagine um, what the world looks like living beyond the binary. And I think that that is incredibly possible for all of us if we are all willing to take that step together. Yes. Yes, I mean, oof, I always feel like after we've just introduced the panelists, I've had a full meal. Like, woof, <laughs> well, all right, I gotta go digest what I just heard for uh, four days. Uh, and I'm sure you're all sitting there feeling the same. Um, this invitation that you just gave us, Tokazani, around this is not just for uh, trans individuals. This is not just for our teenagers. And I often hear, uh, you know, adults of a certain age say, oh, that's just teenagers being teenagers as they explore this and that. You know, I, I do always come back sometimes with clients and remind them that if you want to understand why you're having relationship problems, do this work. If you want to understand why you're struggling in your workplace, do this work. If you want to understand what's going on in our society, do this work. So much even in terms of the binary attitudes that we default to within our love-based partnerships can be interrogated through this binary lens that we are all conditioned to, as Sherry Huber teaches around the conditioning that we are all invited to as children. Dr. Lulu, recently I had my own experience because I think uh, within the Black community and within the U.S., I will say we're often uh, easily aligned around, you know, fighting racism and having that discussion. But this is still a very homophobic and transphobic uh, and alloyist community, especially coming out of the Black Christian church. And in my own journey as an ally, trying to be an ally, trying to be an accomplice and a reminder that you cannot define yourself as an ally or accomplice. It is an invitation from within community. But as uh, someone desirous of doing my practice around unlearning uh, homophobia, unlearning transphobia, unlearning alloyism, we had an experience at work recently where one of my uh, longtime friends and colleagues who's on the call today, I thought I was trying to show my advocacy by defaulting to they, them pronouns as my norm. And it was very important to them in a process of unlearning and self-exploration that they'd been undergoing to uh, move from what had been they, them, all pronouns to very specifically she, her pronouns, and I failed them in a moment. And I felt that shit hard. Even in this work, what is your, what is, what is, what is your lesson? What is your advice to the person around to do this work is not to experience the absence of mistakes? How, how do you coach people through that? I was waiting for you to say that. It's very simple. Three words are four words. To err is human. It's four words, okay. To err is human. To forgive is divine. Not because we're trying to be in a religious space, but because it starts from forgiveness of self and embracing your brokenness on your journey towards imperfection because no one is show me a perfect person i'll show you i'll show you a liar right mm. Just forgive yourself you will make the mistakes the parents that i work with every monday i am as much a part of the group support group as i am their coach i do not 
try to pretend to know. At 53 years old, I'm only now beginning to unlearn and realize that you are not what happens to you. You must separate self from the knowledge that was impacted on self. Otherwise, self will destruct. So I have to do that and realize that my parents didn't know any better. Mm. Or whoever was my teacher didn't know any better and learned to hold space for them. Even as I took my own child to my best friend who was a pastor when they were, I don't know, 13. To this day, I don't know what I wanted, but I wanted something. I don't know what it was. And so I have to be okay with saying that was me then. Once you know better, once you know better, then the world expects you to do better. Mm. So you can err as long as you don't know better. I still I had to ask her, so is it still they, them, or is it she, her? So that my own brain too can begin to learn to accept that which she prefers. And so she's like, well, mom, actually she, I said, okay. And let's do it. Let's go with she. Do we miss? Yeah, because for two years, it was for 20, I don't know, two years, it was he. Then for two years, it was they. And now it's she. So I have to allow my 53-year-old brain to be okay with the fact that I am becoming. Thank you, Michelle Obama. I am becoming. So I'm coming from the future self to say it's actually okay. You don't, you do not go to school to learn, I don't know, your ABCs and learn it the first day your teacher teaches it to you. No. So we, we must be about being human and knowing that the word learn means an ongoing process. But when you're ready to ride a bike, if you fall off the bike, you don't say, oh my God, I fell off the bike, I'll never ride again. No, you say, you know, I'm going to get up. If anybody saw me, that's fine because I'm going to get it. And that's what they, they want us to do. They want us to realize that even they misgender themselves sometimes or misgender their friends sometimes. It is, it's, you have to consciously be on learning. So I'm very happy that you asked that question because it's perfect. It's the process in it. And hopefully one of my siblings in the, or nibblings in the panel will join me in this and just kind of say, am I completely off? <laughs> or am I, because I am a, cisgendered woman. I've always been a girl, which is why I tell people, I said, you can't tell me I'm not a girl. And that's why I cannot tell X that they're not their gender. Mm. Mm. So, mm. Uh, River, beautiful. Yeah, movie. River, Fokusani, Scott, what's coming up for you? Yeah, I, uh, I'll speak to that briefly. And um, I think a lot of that's really well said. You know, you spoke uh, a little bit about um, feeling like you're misgendering somebody when using they, them. That's actually an anecdote I use pretty frequently, right? Because I do use she, her pronouns and it can be incredibly inclusive when you don't know somebody's pronouns to just speak of them as they, them at a baseline. But like I had a coworker, for instance, at my last job, knew I used she, her pronouns and certainly wanted to be inclusive at a baseline but we worked together a year and a half and, and they were still using they, them pronouns for me. And we had to have a bit of a conversation. I was like, no, you know, like she, her makes me feel embodied. Those are the pronouns that I choose to use. And I do think to error is human. I do think that that is like an inherent part of like moving through the world. Right. I think that a lot of people get in their own way um, when it comes to like doing the right thing because they're worried about slipping up. And they're worried about making mistakes. And when we talk about like what to do when you misgender a trans person, you know, so many people will default to just falling straight onto their swords and going, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I never do this. I can't believe it. I am so upset that I've misgendered you. And you're just kind of like, no, 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 it's okay. Like, like, like just apologize, move on. We're going to get through this together. Like this is as awkward for me as it is for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the, the big things that I talk about, especially when it comes to people that are, that are changing pronouns and stuff like that, it's all about those neural pathways, right? It's all about like, like reinforcing that and really internalizing somebody's pronouns. So anytime you misgender someone, it can really help to think like three to five sentences in your head, like using their correct pronouns. And then you are like 
really internalizing that, right? Nothing throws me off more than when I'm having a conversation with somebody and I can see them thinking really hard about my pronouns. And they're like, yeah, I was talking about you the other day. And I was like, she is very cool. And, and nothing feels more awkward than just kind of like stumbling into that. But yeah, I, I think really well said, Dr. Lulu. It's a, it's a, a really nice prompt. Uh, and that's, that's kind of my two cents on the matter for sure. Yeah. I have to ask though, because as uh, Dr. Lulu said, uh, and myself coming from a cisgendered experience, and yet on the other side of uh, racialized experiences, there are also days where I'm not your damn teacher, right? I am uh, also in terms of my bandwidth at a very low capacity for forgiveness, for patience. Tukazani, can you, have you ever had a a moment like that? (laughs) Um, <laughs> was it you laughed? <laughs> um, it is, you know what it is. I, I laugh because I'm still there. I'm still in the process of um, learning um, forgiveness, learning patience. Um, and I think, and, and, and that's the thing because they are, my, my existence is political. I'm fat. I'm black, I'm agender. I, there's so much of me that I have to constantly educate others on, right? And so my bandwidth is really low. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's super, it's super low. And, and I have to be honest about it. And I, I you know, um, and that's not to say I'm unwilling to engage or unwilling to um, take people by the hand and, and, take them on this journey with me but I and and I love I love everything you said Dr. Lulu and River because I I resonate so much with it where you know it it does get perception is an interesting thing right and I think the 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 issue around forgiveness is also linked with perception and it also then seeps into then how you perceive yourself and so sometimes I feel like there are moments for the sake of your own perception of yourself that you need to be unforgiving. And you just have to choose those moments. Um, and that's not to say that you, you have to be harsh about being unforgiving, but there needs to be some, there needs to be protections around yourself, right? So for example, I use he, they pronouns. In the binary spectrum, I present femme, right? So it's no secret that you would look at me and assume I'm a woman. I am, however, not. And so a lot of my existence is constantly negotiating space around wanting people to remember that my he pronouns exist, but people only being comfortable going that step to they because they're like, get, they make sense and I can kind of negotiate they, but he is a little uncomfortable for me because I do not perceive you as he. But for me, he isn't gendered, right? So for me, he is the pronoun I align with, but it is not to say that I align with manness or masculinity if we're talking binarism, right? So thinking about all of those moments and that context where I'm constantly negotiating, constantly navigating, constantly asking, constantly begging for people to see me as I am, to see who I see in the mirror. Mm. I really, I, I really feel like sometimes you just don't need to be forgiving. And, and again, I think that those are, those are moments. And that's not to say that like, I, you know, I have lovers, I have friends, I have people who, yes, they do, they will hear me for three, four weeks. And then one day it's like a slip up of a she, you know, and, and, and that's it. And my thing is always like, let's not make it awkward for all of us in the room. You just keep it moving. You say you, you slip up and then you, and then we just keep going. And, and it's less awkward and less hurtful in my experience when we're, when you're not, what's the word? When you're not showing that the thumb is red. (laughs) you know what I mean like it's 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 just 
so much better for us to pretend like the moment never happened and for us to kind of just move on, like not to pretend it never happened, but to acknowledge that it happened and just, you know, move past it, then it'd be this massive spectacle because sometimes it feels like a spectacle because now I'm sitting in a cafe and you are, oh my God, I got your pronouns wrong. I'm so sorry. And now we're both looking awkward and sitting there and it's, it's just, it's not great. It's not great for anyone in that situation. And that's why I say, yes, to err is to human. Like you, you will, you will make mistakes. And, but I think you also have to give space to gender diverse or marginalized gendered people to choose whether or not they forgive you Mm. for it and to, to allow them to have that moment of like when it's okay for them and when it's not. Um, And I think that's where sometimes there is a bit of tension. I'm going to stop quickly, but I think that's where there is a bit of tension where there's this um, expectation to be forgiven all the time and not an understanding that people's capacity on any given day is not the same as what you found them the other day. And there has to be room to allow marginalized genders to just not forgive to be frustrated, to be annoyed, to get up and leave from that coffee table. Um, Because this is hard, existing like this is hard. Um, And so, yeah, so I think my offering for that is that you're absolutely allowed to make mistakes. And I hope that you also give space for those mistakes to be received as either forgiven or unforgiven. Yeah, I love that. I, I was going to add really quick that I think I said that maybe I did what I thought I did. Um, my whole premise of forgiveness is of self. It's of self. Because if you make it a big deal, then you make it a spectacle. It's of self. Not so much because I, I don't have any. I don't have any bandwidth. But y'all have little. I have none. Which is why I said my name is Dr. Lou. It's just so the thing about it is it's forgiveness of self because it's because like she's like, I think Weaver said, because you're so you feel this way about yourself, that's you make it. Oh my God, I can't believe it's the way you perceive yourself. So forgiveness of self is what I preach all day, every day, because like you, I'm in the space of queer, black African with a huge, beautiful accent that I love and so much more. Forgive yourself and move on. So yeah, but I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely forgiveness of self first. Not not me to forgive you. There's nothing to forgive. But you need to forgive yourself. Yeah, I think um, there's there's something that happens there that extends not just into like like gender discourse, but anytime you wrong someone and you are just elevating yourself to really like center your own apology, you're really doing that person a disservice. Right. You need to really take care of that person's feelings before you take care of your own. And it's the same when you misgender someone. Um, We talk a lot about allyship. And I think it's like really inherently important to think as an ally, not as something you are, but allyship as a thing that you do, an action that you take. And there's there's so much beauty in little moments like that. And like learning to navigate like disagreements and and if you're stumbling over your own feet in any way, you know, don't, don't elevate yourself over somebody else's feelings that you have hurt. And I, it's really neat. I really, I really appreciate both of your perspectives. This is really cool. Yes. I hear a couple of takeaways for everybody who's listening in one to air is human. And uh, also to have a really bad day where you just feel like being bitchy. That's also human. So uh, give yourself that permission. Uh, And two, this practice of what is the the work of self-forgiveness? Because I think one of the reasons that we adhere so much to these binaries within our existence is to avoid our own pain, Mm. our own personal processing, the ways that we have Uh, been taught to normalize constant self-shaming, constant self-flagellation. And so we're looking for something externalized to put into neat, tidy boxes. Even though around us, we see all of this data to affirm that uh, human existence is not neat and tiny boxes. 
but it's a really great way to avoid looking at self. In this process of uh, finding your own identity in this work, in this practice, and uh, whomever is ready to, you know, jump in the water first on this question, what have you learned? What have you had to forgive or to heal about yourself? I mean, I don't mind going first just because, I mean, I, it's just, like I said at the beginning, just believing all the BS that I was fed when I was a child. I was, I'm a cradle Catholic. I'm, I'm African, I'm West African, I'm Nigerian, I'm Igbo, all the way down to my grandfather's homestead. All of the things I thought were true, I have to let go of that person Mm. Because she didn't, I, you know, it's just the, the whole process of becoming this person who now knows a little bit different. And now my job is to pass the baton because that knowledge is not given to me to keep it and observe it and nurse it. And I have to pass the baton. It was a very difficult decision to leave medicine because I used to say peds for life. I used to sign off peds for life. Like I would die a pediatrician. But I didn't realize that now, actually, I have, I have more work, even more difficult than going to medical school, which is just trying to get a hardcore X, whatever that X is for you to see their child as a whole person and not broken or damaged or bringing shame to you, which is what African families say. Because the whole concept of LGBT is brought all the way down to one activity in the bedroom. And so they only see it as a shame. Oh my God, you're going to shame the family name, things like that. So I've learned to let go of that person who thought that way. Yeah. 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 That's really well said. I think, I think for me, the hardest thing that I have been trying to look at for years and definitely getting a lot better at, but especially when I first started the transition was um, internalized transphobia and uh, internalized misogyny, you know, those things are so prolific. And I didn't transition until I was 25, but I knew that I was trans so much longer before that. And it was because of internalized transphobia that I couldn't look directly at that problem. And I just put it in a box and put that box in a box and put it under the bed. And it took moving to Seattle and being surrounded by this like beautiful community and like going to Ingersoll and going, Oh my gosh, they're just like fully embodied people just like me. And I can still be authentically myself and be really happy in the way that I'm moving through the world and transition. And that lens has certainly um, kind of like, like grown into my greater worldview because I think that there is something really beautiful about radical accountability, right? Like mm -hmm. looking at your problems directly when you think a thought that doesn't line up with your personal code of ethics going, why did I think that? And how can I stop my brain from doing that in the future? Because that's not who I am and that's not who I want to be. And the truth is like, like whoever you want to be, that's, that's who you are if you take the steps to get there. Right. And that that's not just looking at the things that you love about yourself, but it's looking really directly and intimately at the things that you don't like so much about yourself. And that was really difficult for me. But um, as I'm kind of like building community and, and feeling really embodied as myself and I get to be surrounded with so many people that I love, it also lets me put myself under a microscope. And as difficult as that is, like it has certainly helped me reach a, a much closer place of alignment with like exactly who I want to be. And that growth is like still there, right? I've got a long way to go. And I think that's a part of it too. Yes. Yes. Oh, Lizzie, you're stressing me with these prompts. <laughs> he said, it's bedtime where I am. I know. <laughs> 
Honestly, I think this has made me feel incredibly emotional because as I'm hearing both Dr. Lulu and River talk, I'm just thinking like, have I let go yet? Um, and, and, I, and I think that was like, I, there was a very big mirror that was like held up to me right now. And I'm very uncomfortable about it. But I think that's the thing, right? Um, so my transition has also, has also been late. I'm, I'm 30 in September and I, I recently had top surgery November last year. Um, thank you. <laughs> and, and I, I, you know, I have known for, since I was six, that I wasn't a boy, that I wasn't a girl, but I just didn't have the language for what it was that I was experiencing. And I think one thing, I have so much resentment for the years I've lost, um, not being my final form, I call it my final form, um, because it's, because I'm just like, I, I'm so happy now, but I've only been this happy in the last five years, and, and now I, 25 years are gone, um, and it was turmoil, and it was confusion, and it was gender envy, and then it was gender dysphoria, and then it was this, and it was that, and they, it's just like, and the more I think about, you know, the imposition of womanhood and what that did to me and how it also just like really, you know, messed up how I view myself sexually, how I view myself in my sexuality as a queer person. It's, it's just like, the, you know, it's, it's one of those things you, you open the box and you realize there's like another box and, and then you have to take that box out. And then it's like, you, or, you know, you go to therapy and you think you're going to therapy for one thing. And then you realize that actually there's a long list of things here. And I think that's, that's the thing for me is that as I'm going through this process of letting go, I'm realizing there's so much more to let go and I'm tired and I want to enjoy this moment. And I really want to, you know, enjoy feeling good within myself, finally coming home to myself but then there's all this work that happens in the background where I'm like, I have to reconcile and I have to forgive myself for being angry that little me had no idea what was going on, but tried anyway and tried to figure it out. You know, I have to extend grace to all the versions of me before this final form. And I think that's something that I'm still grappling with. And so Letting go, I don't know if I've let go. I don't know if, you know, I don't know how, to what extent or how far I've let go. But what I'm learning to do is to extend grace to all the versions of myself and leave it at that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Kifani, you're, you're so cool. You're very, very <laughs> neat. That was really well said. I, yeah, it, it does. It does feel like there's always another box. And, and you know, I, I also try to conceptualize that like final form and, and maybe it exists in some capacity and I'll, I'll get there, but I'm, I'm certainly not going to stop trying. And I, yeah, I carry all of that like shame and like resentment. And I have so much capacity for forgiveness for other people, but it, when it comes to me, it's really hard for some reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Same, same here. <laughs> Just he's in a pod, you and I. <laughs> I think you would find almost everybody on this call can relate to that, that invitation to the, the final countdown is to uh, be able to extend um, grace to oneself. Um, David asked, if a binary individual meets a non-binary individual, what is the best way to talk or share, especially at work? He said he wants training will levels here, please. A basic understanding of how to relate. And this is important because uh, as we create this space, constantly reminding ourselves we're at different stages of different journeys of unlearning. And so thank you, David, for the bravery if a binary individual meets a non-binary individual, or if I'm identifying as binary, I believe the question is, what is the best way to talk or share, especially at work? Yeah, I can, uh, I can hop in just real quick and say just a couple things on that. Um, one, thank you for the question. It's, it's really well stated. I think 
the neat thing about cisgender people and transgender people and non-binary people is that we are all just people and we all have fun little hobbies and fun little things to relate on. You know, if you both like sports, you can talk about sports, but the essence of it is to make sure that you are really internalizing their identity, really understanding non-binary identities and really making sure you're hitting their pronouns. I'm sure that y'all have a little bit more to add than that, but as far as like relating on a human level, you know, you can do that. Um, With some folks, it's easier to relate than others. I know that there are people in my life that I don't have anything in common with, but I still love them deeply. Um, So, you know, I I think it's really important to just conceptualize that, that they are people all the same as you with with their little people problems, and, and they are doing their best to move through the world as they can. Yeah. For me, um, I teach a class to physicians called 10, um, LGBTQ plus basics, 10 things your queer patient wishes you knew. And I, and I advise the physicians, when you walk in the room, hi, my name is Dr. Lulu, my pronouns are, I promise you, they're the most empowering words in today's world because we now know My pronouns are, you lead with your pronouns. Your name tag has your pronouns. Everyone at your job has their pronouns. It says a lot without saying a lot. It tells the person who is on the, oh, wait, the space is affirming. They don't have to tell you their own pronouns. They don't have to say anything. At work, we always focus on the bottom line. As a physician, you focus on your patient coming back. I can only talk about what I know. I talk about patients because that's what I know. That patient's mother, that patient, that person's cousin is going to say, oh my God, listen, Tommy, River, whoever, that doctor, you need to go there. They're not going to, they didn't have to tell you any other thing. That's the doctor you need to go see because they know that that doctor knows. So for me, I, I just say that now because you, you can say what's your pronoun. You can start by, you can say, say your own and say, what, what are your pronouns? You can, you know, oh, hi, my name is Dr. Lulu. What's your name? Something like that. Um, hi, my name is Dr. Lulu. These are my pronouns. You can stop there. You can say, what are your pronouns? All you're doing is giving them permission to tell you their pronouns. What a, it's the most affirming thing you can do in today's world because the pronouns now leads me to, to a bigger conversation that may or may not be heard, had that day. So that's kind of all I have to say. Yeah. Ooh, but you I, touched. Oh, go ahead, Lindsay. No, go ahead, Reverend. Cool. Thank you. No, I was just going to say you've touched on something that is really, really important and near and dear to my heart and that I'm super passionate about. And that is modeling behavior, right? Because that's what makes the world go around. It's, it's really important for shifting greater societal dialogue, but like say you and I are at like a little networking event or, or we're doing something like this in person and you come up to me and you go, hey, what are your pronouns? Then, then something starts happening in my brain. I go, oh, you've noticed I'm trans. I've been clocked. Now I'm feeling weird about myself and I'm perceiving myself a little bit more than I want to. But if you come up to me and you go, hey, I'm Lindsay. I use she, her pronouns. Yes. Then that opens the door for me to just go, oh, I'm River. I use she, her pronouns too. It's so nice to meet you. And like, that's that thing you're saying, Dr. Lulu. Like there's, there's that... <laughs> The, the word of mouth within the queer community is so prolific. I've had so many friends be like, you need to go see this therapist. She's so good. She's so affirming. And, and that stuff is really cool. But modeling behavior is really important, right? When we look at pronoun pins and when we look at like, like pronouns and email signature and stuff like that, before cisgender people started using pronouns in their signatures, if you got an email and somebody had their pronouns, your brain might go, oh, that's a trans person. But now suddenly everybody's doing it and you're not just like othering people, right? Mm. So modeling behavior is, is this really beautiful thing. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lulu. That's, that's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I just want to expand on what you're saying, I think, River, in that, you know, the, what we often find in the work is that the, the challenge is not that difference exists, is that we still as a society associate difference with deficit. And so I don't want you to walk up to me and pretend that you do not see that I am black or that I am uh, she, her, or my pronouns, right? 
the the move that we're trying to get to is that difference is celebrated. <laughs> difference is normal and normalized. And so there's also, when we're hoping to enter into authentic relationship, deep relationship, and especially for our organizational leaders, where you now find yourself in a position when you are managing somebody and you are in a gross learning curve around their intersectional identities, one of the things we encourage leaders to do is to name it. Don't pretend like I don't I don't see difference. I, I don't see color, right? You you just told me to grab the blue cup out of the kitchen. I know you see color, right? I I, I know that you see that my pronouns are hey, they, you know, he, they, right? What would it look like if we normalize for leaders to say, I want to get this right? and I am in a process of learning, and I'm naming the inherent power dynamic here, where I'm a manager and it would require a level of emotional burden to call me in. And I am going to take this practice of education upon myself, right? What if we started to normalize that within our organizations? The work is mine as the leader, I name that, here's the training that I'm going to be engaged in, that I am going to be doing over here, not your responsibility as my team member, as my direct report. And I think I'm gonna get it wrong. And I want you to, to call me in, to call me in as many times as necessary. And so, you know, in my own experiences of, uh, you know, this work, I see really amazing things happening at organizations. And River and Ilona, I want to invite you back up. Maybe you're noticing this in the organizations you're coaching at GSBA around how are people applying this in the day-to-day -day work environment? Yeah, that's a really good prompt. You know, I started and I have to give a, a, a shout out. I would be remiss to not give a shout out to my coworker Levi, who I see is in the audience. We do these really Levi. wonderful trainings together. Levi is brilliant. And uh, it's, it's because of Levi that this is like the primary focus of my job now. And I have such a blast giving these trainings. Um, it's, it's really a hot button issue now. And there's always a question in my brain about whether these trainings are being done because they actually want to support queer employees or because they're checking a box, right? Um, but most of the uh, companies that I've had the pleasure of working with have really, like, they've uploaded the trainings to their employee portals and made it like a mandatory part of onboarding. I've gotten questions about, like, how can I be more inclusive with this like gendered checkbox that we have and things like that? I think that um, as difficult as things are right now, as many anti-trans bills as we have seen introduced in the last several years, things are still getting better, uh, at least from a greater cultural dialogue. You know, one of the statistics we share in one of our trainings is that um, I think my, my partner will correct me if I get this wrong. She's sitting right next to me, but it's, it's something like 80% no of the population supports like LGBTQ plus like, like advocacy and human rights issues. And um, yeah, I think that assuming good faith, because there is a lot of like earnest folks. And I think that most of the people that I have the pleasure of interacting with when we do these trainings, they, they really authentically want to be better people and a lot of their like like inherent lack of progress just comes from fear, fear of messing mm -hmm. up. And I always, 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 always want to give people the opportunity to mess up and ask whatever questions they want to ask. And I just I I really always see forward progress, especially from the orgs that come to me for like additional sessions, right? They have so many fun stories to share or anecdotes. One of the things that I always love is like, oh, we had uh, an employee that has like a trans kiddo and, and suddenly they felt like they had the language to like really relate with their kid. But yeah, I, I'm recklessly optimistic, I think, but I, I really think that we are seeing some really, really, really good moves. We can all use a dose of reckless optimism, River. 
As we move to leave this space today, uh, Dr. Lulu Tokozani, River, just something you said, River, really stands out in terms of this practice of moving more authentically towards self and acceptance of self. And, you know, I think what our panelists have invited me into a deeper reflection on is that when it feels like we are existing in a time and a space and a world where there's so much that appears to be out of our control, when we have uh, senseless acts that are devastating to our, to our beings happening on a routine basis, if you are struggling with why does unlearning this binary, why is that important to me? What I would leave you with to marinate on is that if somebody is actively engaged in the process of learning to love themselves more, that is a liberatory act. And that do not waste your time trying to deny somebody access to loving themselves more. And if we could focus on giving that invitation to everyone instead of denying it, that's the change that I want to see in the world. Thank you as always for being here, for creating this space together. Dr. Lulu Tokozani, River, for your authenticity, for your teachings, for your lessons, for your invitations to love. Happy Wednesday, everyone. I needed to put on uh, Jean's theme song. I think she suggested something by We Are One by Maze. I'll have to send that out and let you know. Mm. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the comments in the, in the comment section. Um, are we speaking for the after thing or no? Yeah, just stay in after a few minutes, um, just to chat and, and reflect on how the time is going. Um, I also wanted to see if there's anything that um, anyone would want to add to Mitchell's question around specifically how to have this um, in relating with, with older generations specifically, since he works primarily with them. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's where, where Mitchell's question was. And it sounded like, Mitchell, you said you really got most of what you're looking for. Um, specifically with this, with the generation you're working with, where you're finding this extra level of resistance. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Please answer. No, oh, no, I was just going to say one of the things that I have decided to accept is that I can't save everyone. This is just my own personal philosophy. I have a father who is in his 80s who has a, suddenly has a transgender daughter. It's, it's, it's semi unimaginable, but then for him, but then again, he has watched this child grow in my belly up until they're 25 years old. So I told him, I said, the only thing I can tell you to do is to literally go into the space where you learn of everything else that is unimaginable. Just go there. And then, Leave it alone because this is still your grandchild, still needing your love and affirmation, still needing your praise and needing everything that they've always needed from you. And as long as you dig your heels in and say, well, I don't understand it, you're not going to move. I cannot sit here today and tell you that I understand waking up in the morning and feeling like I'm a boy. I can't. But I can understand waking up every morning and feeling like I'm a girl. I am 100% sure of that. And so if someone else says that they are, I cannot therefore argue with that. And so I told my dad, I said, you have to find it in a space where you put everything else, like the internet to him. is like, oh my God, what internet? And I was like, well, put it in the internet, but in the same box as it. He doesn't understand that I can call him on the phone and I can see him. Because when he was a younger person, 
the phone, we had to take the cord and dial the thing and with the numbers go around and then tell the thing. That was him. And so I do get it. But then I said, but for the sake of moving forward, because the question you always ask is, what does your grandchild need from you now? Give it to them. And nine times out of 10 is not, I need to understand it first, because let's face it, we support our friends who do things that we don't understand all the time. I cannot believe you're marrying that guy. I told, da, 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 but I'm going to be at the wedding, right? I can't believe you're moving to San Diego, but I'll come visit. I mean, we, we, we do that for people, but when it comes to our children, and I say that because I'm here as a parent, we dig our heels in because as parents, we want to control. So... That's, that's all I have. No, I, I love it. You know, I had a hard time when I transitioned with my mom, but it was nothing compared to some of the dialogues I had with my grandmother. But she learned and so did my mom. And my mother had this orientation when, because because my my grandmother said the textbook, like, like, supportive like do not say this to a trans person thing which was you will always be dead name to me but you you do you and I was like grandmother that's actually that's actually really problematic and it hurts my feelings um and my grandmother responded to me speaking directly to that but when I shared that worry to my mom my mom was like well you know your your grandmother is you know she's just getting up there and and learning new things is hard and my mother has also said before you know i'm too old to learn and i was like there is no such thing mom you have to be patient with yourself and i think that when it comes to edification especially uh with people who like you said dr lulu are kind of want to like dig their heels in um it's it's really good to be like gentle and compassionate i do have a little bit of that like radical like like it's okay to be mad sometimes um and and there are some people that are definitely willfully obstinate and no matter how much gentle correction you give them will not change their ways and i think knowing when to walk away is important but I, I really do believe that the vast majority of people want to be good to each other. And I think like operating on good faith is really important. Tokazani, did you have anything else to share? I, I feel like, so this is interesting because I am technically not out to my parents <laughs> um so if they find this oops um and also which also you know by default <laughs> means that i i'm not out to my elders um i i really love what dr lulu and river have said it's always important for me whatever you do in life is always important to operate from a place of compassion first um, before anything else and it's always important to operate from a place of good faith like I'm assuming that this is this is a moment we're having and that this is an interaction that could potentially revolutionize how we engage with each other moving forward and I don't think that there is a an age limit to learning or there's an age limit to acceptance, or there's an age limit to like variations in love. You know what I mean? Like we, there's, you, you'll you never stop evolving and you'll never stop growing. And that, but I think in different spaces and with different people, different approaches need to be used. And, I always say that, you know, with elders and, and people who have existed in this world, living completely, you know, I think also because I think of, I, there was a tweet I read, sorry, I'm digressing, but I promise this, there's a point. Um, there was a tweet I read about this um, girl who was speaking with her mom and her mom was saying something like, oh, I don't want to watch, I think it was, what's that new Netflix um, show that queer Netflix show Heartstoppers or something. Heart. 
you know that one and the mom says oh i don't want to watch that because it's going to like ignite feelings i used to have for girls and so the person was like so you're And the mom was like, no, 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 no. That was just like something that happened like in the past, but like, God forbid I'm, I'm back now. And this person wrote to your mom that, you know, she might be bi or she might be queer or she, and this person was like, no, I don't think I'm going to, because I don't think she's there yet. I don't think she's ready to face that. And what I can do is hold her hand through this process. And I can talk, have conversations with her that gently unravel things at the pace that she is willing to go. If she's not willing to go, then I can't force a, this type of revelation on her. And I think that's always my stance um, with people in, you know, whatever demographic they're in is that, and again, it's that thing of like education. How, how much do you expend her? educating others and 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 pouring into others but I think that there has to, you know at whatever point you decide that this is an interaction I'm going to have it move from a place of compassion and also realize who your audience is who you're navigating the space with I think we hope that we are spoken into existence immediately when we uh, come to the people that we love. And sometimes I know for sure <laughs> that if I showed up to my parents and was like, hey, so this happened, it would not be received well. And so there's been a very slow, a slow burn, a gradual, you know, even at my big age of 30, being like, I know my parents are not here yet, but there's enough I can feed them to get them to a point where eventually they'll get it. Um, but I think that it really is one of those things where it's time, it's place, it's person, it's age, it's background. It's, there's so many things to consider um, when you decide that this is the interaction I'm going to have. And I think as much as we always say that, and this might be controversial, as much as we always say that we have to, or what I say is that, you know, as much as you're allowed to make a mistake, you also have to give someone the room to be forgiving or unforgiving. As much as you come to someone with um, your whole self, they have the option, they, not that they are allowed to, but they have the option to accept or reject you. Um, that option exists to them. And so... Um, yeah, so I, I think that you have to be prepared for that possibility to exist. And if that's the case, then how do we take apart this big thing into little smaller things that we can work together moving forward from? I think I'm going to stop there. Sorry, it's a little bit late now. So I'm <laughs> no, <you're> wonderful. <laughs> This is always the case. We're like, uh, so we'll just um, move to the living room where we'll be serving drinks and um, <laughs> chocolates and cookies now. Um, I unfortunately okay. have to run, but uh, Laura will keep holding space. But I just want to, before I go, say again, River and Dr. Lulu and uh, Tokozani, how uh, I think many people's lives were touched today. So we certainly set an intention and then expanded upon it. Thank you for being used in the capacity of teacher and healer, which is, you know, especially uh, in, I think, many of the communities that we're all indigenous to, it is our birthright, that healing work that we so often find ourselves doing. And so, um, that said, as we move through this space, naming certain things that I heard, that if you need space held just for you, you have my email. Okay, I love Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It was really, really good to meet you, especially since I have been at GSBA and we hadn't met yet. This was, this was very, very cool. 
I'm I'm excited to uh, to hopefully do something in person and uh, and hang out one on one. That'd be great. Yeah, they're all yes. wonderful. We have to fly these two into Seattle. Come on, yeah. please. So good, so good, so good, so good. I'm excited. Let us know when you're doing something in person. We'll be there. We'll come support. I know. We keep saying that after every panel, we're like, so we want to hold this like diversity conference where people fly in from all over the world. And it's like a big kind of unlearning symposium, you know, yeah. and we're really just one part unlearning, one part imagining, as Tokozani is saying, like, even like through the gaming world, how can we play games that allow us to imagine and play in spaces that are making diversity normal and normalized? More to come, more to come. Very cool. Thank you so much, Lindsay. As I put in the chat, panelists, if you have any comments about, about the uh, event, want to stay on, address for a living room. It's a, it's a joke. <laughs> she, she mentioned having drinks in the living room, I know. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, I don't have that information for you right now. But I'm, get in now. I'm like, we got it, no problem. Um, actually, the address is going to, I think it's going to be this co-working space that I'm in, in my apartment Ooh. building. I oh my gosh, the little hanging chairs. The little Stop. hangy chairs. It's that got a whole so vibe. Um, I specifically chose a place that would have co-working spaces because I get ants in my pants when yeah. I have to stay home yeah Mitchell um, I was just saying that's that's very very cool work you're doing I think absolutely. Like, like working with elders is is really important edifying elders is really cool like education is is real neat and it's for everybody it turns out I was reading an article about uh this 80 year old woman who just graduated with her PhD and it was like hell yeah that's great like <laughs> very cool <laughs> well river not only that um as you probably know the number of people transitioning between the ages of 65 and 85 um is actually on the rise so yeah well you know so pretty exciting it's <sighs> so cool i when when we look at it right like like one of the like transphobic discourse things you see a lot is like well why are trans people so like why is it so trendy to transition and no it's the same thing that we saw when we stopped punishing people for being left-handed right when when it becomes part of the greater cultural discourse people are like oh suddenly that's accessible to me i think that's really really cool handed that's such a good metaphor it's one of those things you don't control it's just part of you and if people told you you couldn't, well, then you pretended that you didn't. And then if they told you you could, you're like, oh, yeah, actually, while we're at it, if you're giving me the option, I would totally use my left hand. So I stopped knocking right. it over. Yeah. Well, that's one of the graphs that we use in our little trainings. Well, OK, so one of the graphs we will use because it's been like nebulously on my to-do list to actually put it into the slide deck for a while. Mm -hmm. But it's just like a, a, a an in a, a, like total climb based on when they stopped punishing people for being left-handed and people were like, oh, okay, now I can identify that I am left-handed, right? Like, wow. same thing. Mm. Mm. That's actually, that seems like, Mitchell, to, to your question of, you know, like ways that people can understand if they seem like they're generally open to understanding, but are just having, taking time to adapt, it's like, well, you know, yeah, you, know, you know, they they probably do remember when it was more demonized to write with your left hand. So, um, um. yeah, great example. And um, I'm I I have a great time with them. So we we talk about all of it. So that's that's yeah. um, I love my job, and that's what I yeah. get to do is to try and bring them forward. Yeah. You know, because they they will have peers that they're working with. So right, okay. right, love that. I'm so wholesome. Um, panelists, thank you. I know that y'all may have to run to various things. We're certainly over time. Dr. Lulu has uh, the first annual summit happening quite soon. Um, so I don't want to hold you past when we were going to chat, but if there was anything, um, as Lindsay said, if there's anything during the panel that you just wanted to keep reflecting on, you can always message me, message Lindsay. Um, and we'll just keep the conversation going. I mean, 
people's responses in the chat were so um, engaged and just really pulling out specific lines and, and ideas and practical tips that resonated with them, which to me means, okay, they were really paying attention and, and, and there's such a, a hunger for this information. Um, and the way that you all approached it was so warm and humanizing and just like recentering and hi, we're people who also have problems who also <laughs> like, <laughs> just like Laura, snacks, you know? <laughs> you, you certainly deserve tremendous accolades as well for making this all happen and scheduling yes. everyone and getting everyone in the room. Like panel formats are so great but they're not super great if people don't come. So <laughs> thank you so much for making everything happen and making such like a cool space. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved having more GSBA people. It was like, this is, I do need a digital after party. Um, Bye Mitchell. Bye, so Mitchell. nice to meet you. Bye Mitchell. Thank you. I'm like, we do. Yeah. We, we need, we need a digital after party. Cause I just, I always just want to, I want to hang out with the panelists too long. Um, we should we you. should do something. You're in the city. My partner yeah. and I love meeting people and hanging out. So you know, anytime any of you are in Seattle, please hit me up. I'm gonna email both of you because you're both wonderful. Uh, I've had the best time, honestly. Thank you so much for such a rich and like I don't know, y'all. I've been going through things this week, and this yeah. was just so warm and affirming mm. and also like oh let me not cry Dr. Lulu honestly like you have given me so much hope <laughs> engaging with my parents mm -hmm. African parents are a <laughs> whew, an obstacle on their own and so it's just been I'm just I just feel so blessed and 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 grateful to have been able to share such a beautiful space with the two of you. This panel was just incredible. I'm so inspired. I wanna cry, I wanna scream, I wanna do backflips. Like, I don't know what I'm feeling, but I'm feeling a lot. Um, Laura Kay, thank you. I've been calling you Laura in emails and I just realized you're Laura Kay and I want to apologize. It's, 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 it's all Oh my gosh. So no, I I am usually called Laura, but when given the opportunity, it's another one of those things. I'll just be like, because mm? I kind of I don't know. <laughs> would you prefer what would what 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 works best for you? Laura. I will totally respond to both. If you call me Laura K, I'll probably get that extra like little giddy. Giddies. Yeah, get you that dopamine. Yeah. You, you that yeah. dopamine. That dopamine. That's what we want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's just uh, it's just because I I just makes me feel like a southern bell like sitting on the porch <laughs> <laughs> awesome all right okay. i will definitely remember that for our next email exchange but i'm it's quarter to midnight over yeah. on this oh, side. My oh my gosh <laughs> oh, so I, I need to be awake in six hours um right. but again thank you so much um for such a beautiful space i feel healed <laughs> right yeah um, same. you know the so chaos good. at the start of this week I like I feel healed and I'm just I'm so grateful I hope that we can continue to connect River Dr. Lulu I would love to speak more learn more talk more um Please. and Laura Kay see you on the other side of an email <laughs> yeah see you on the flip side <laughs> thank you so much good night <laughs> thanks bye